Good morning. How's it going, guys? Doing okay? I sound a little funny today. I'm fighting some people say some people say it's allergies. Some others are saying it's just a congestion. How's it going? Uh, this, isn't this funny? Like I have to say something, bro. Like I came to San Diego in 1995 with Mauricio, and he just shows up out of nowhere, and we were roommates. I'm like, wow, what's happening here? Uh, anyways. Anyways, I'm Pastor Julian, one of the pastors um, here in San Diego uh, in, in, at Obi Wan, and today we're continuing the book of First Peter. Okay, we're uh, at the end of the book, and we're in chapter five. So if you want to open up your Bibles, it's also going to be on your notes. Um, I just want to remind you what's happening in their context, and uh, we'll apply it to our lives. So uh, there's a map I put it together. Uh, that shows that they were dispersed, right? Everyone that's not a Roman citizen is kicked out of Rome. We don't know if it was by land or if it was by ship, but they end up in those cities. Keep that in mind, all right? Keep that in mind throughout the message because it's almost like they lost their homes. Uh, kids are going to a new school now, uh, new neighbors, people that you liked in the church is not really next door neighbors anymore they, they may be uh, in a different town and so that's their context and then now Peter is in this passage teaching about what should be the relationship between the church and the leaders in the church all right so that's the passage uh, that we're gonna be reading today and so let's uh, read it and then uh, we'll talk about it it starts in I'm getting used to this thing guys reading glasses right it's a new thing in my life it's you have to do this it's so anyway so strange all right so let's read it uh first peter 5 verse 1 to the elders among you i appeal as fellow elder and as a witness of christ's suffering who also will share in the glory to be revealed first of all i want you to pay attention to the word elders right there Okay, so Peter now is talking to the elders. The challenge we have here is that the word elder can mean two things. And that's why I'm going to talk about the same passage twice. The first meaning is simply, simply says pastors. As a pastor, Peter's saying, I'm going to be talking to other pastors. But the word elder can also mean a seasoned Christian, a seasoned follower of Christ. And so the passage is not only applicable to me and to pastors, but it's applicable to all of us. And so that's why uh, in the first part of the message, I'm going to talk to the relationship between pastors and people in the church and the relationship between people in the church with pastors. Then the second time, I'm going to talk to people that are seasoned Christians because the word can mean two things. And so to the elders among you, I appeal as fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering. He also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. Repeat after me, care. Care, okay, so that's the first thing. Watching over them. So now this is a language of protection. Care for them and protect them. Not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording over those who, entrusted, who he entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory that will never fade away. So let's talk about how should pastors be with the flock. I'm going to go kind of fast here because many of you don't have a pastoral calling in your life, but it's good for you to know what God desires from me and pastors and leaders in your life. And so uh, first he said, you know, care for the flock. So care for the people that are in the church and watch over them. Julian, protect the people. That's why I'm so passionate about protecting the unity of our church 
with all these political attacks and everything that's trying to polarize us, you know, if you are or not going to take the vaccine, this and that. And, and I, I so, I'm so passionate about that because we can still be united and be very different right? And you can choose things that are very opposite than what I would have chosen, and we can still be united with Christ and, and united in the cause of Christ. Are you with me? And so he's saying, you know, care for the flock, protect the flock. So when I'm calling out uh, here for us to be united, I'm, tr I'm, I'm watching over the flock. I'm watching for the unity. I don't want your families to fall apart because of uh, this politician or that politician. So you hear things, but know the heart. The heart is always unity. And I, I really care for you and, and your families. Like one of the things that we just got back from a pastor's conference, and one of the things that uh, they said over and over, which is a no-brainer, they, they kind of said in different words, hey, if you don't like people, don't be a pastor. Right? Because pastors and, and the language is a farming language if you have no idea why does God call pastors pastors and why why does he call like the people in the church the flock sheep it's farming language farming language because the shepherd is there to protect the sheep right I'm here to protect I will die for my sheep and Jesus said what I will die for my flock right and then I, he said I am the good shepherd I am the good shepherd. And so all this farming language, and that's when we come to God through Jesus, and the miracle happened, we become sons and daughters of God, and now we become sheep. <laughs> I have thoughts in my mind, and so I will share my thoughts, okay? Didn't God did a good job, like, naming the animals? Like, it's not related to the message at all, okay? It's just stuff that comes to my head. Doesn't a zebra look like a zebra? No, I'm serious. Like a giraffe? Totally giraffe, right? Elephant, right? Anyways, not related. I was thinking about that. I'm like, man, it's amazing. A gorilla looks just like a gorilla. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, anyways, so all this farming language, not related to the message at all. A little bit of my brain for, you, for your entertainment. And so it's saying, care for the flock. Protect the flock. Not because you have to, but because you want to. Not because it's a must, but because you are willing. And then it says, and not pursuing this honest gain. Have this, this understanding, Julian and pastors, and that every dollar that you give, every penny you give is God's. It's not mine. And thank God for the two boards we have. If you don't know a little bit of the organization of our church, we have two boards. We have the board of trustees. We call it ministry council. And we have a financial board. And I'm thankful for that. And, you know, expenses. We have someone that looks at every credit card, every expense that we do here at Obi-Wan. And I'm proud of that because that's a protection. They don't do it. Because you want to, don't pursue dishonest gain, Julian, leaders, pastors. But eager, be eager to serve. Serve the flock, serve the people. Do it look just like Jesus, right? Wash the feet of the disciples. Hey, you, you may, must be thinking now, oh, you know, that's not for me, that's not for me, that's for Pastor Julian, that's for Pastor Chris, that's for Pastor, Pastor Brandon. Hey, really quick, I'm going to turn the table, and it's going to apply to you, okay? So don't tune out, don't tune out, okay? Don't tune out. Um, and it says, not pursuing dishonest gain, but be eager to serve. Do not lord over them. So not this abuse of power because the Lord is entrusting us. It's kind of cool, like, even this building, this building is not mine. I, am I the lead pastor? Yeah, but this building is not mine. We had uh, Pastor Saul and Rosie. They came to us. They're like, can we start a Spanish Bible study at your church? Yes, this is not my building. This is God's building. The, every penny that comes in here, it's not mine. Pastor from Regeneration Church that rents our church, just so you know my heart, I can't wait for them to be in this church for free. 
Why? Because it's the work of the kingdom of God, and I want to bless the church that meets at night here so that the kingdom of God can, can move forward. And so, anyways, not dishonest gain, uh, but, you know, not lording over the people. Don't abuse your power, pastors and leaders, but be an example to the flock. And then in verse 5, there's a shift that happens, and now it applies to you. So pay attention to verse 5, okay? It says, in the same way, you you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. And in Hebrews 13, 17, it says the following. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. As those who will give an account... Let them do this with joy and not with groaning. For what? For that would be of no advantage to you. The language here is the same language that we see in Ephesians chapter 6 that talks about children. Obey your parents because they love you and they want to protect you. So when they put like electrical plugs, right, you know that plastic thing that protects, and you so want to stick a paper clips in there, and mom and dad says no, it's because they love you. So children, obey your parents unto the Lord. It's Now it's translated into a spiritual figure that we move out of our parents' house. We're not under, most of us at least, we're not like under their uh, protection anymore. And what can happen is, many times it can happen, and even in the church, we can become spiritual orphans. And that's a problem of being too independent, and we are. And we are proud of our independence, and I think it's a good thing. I'm raising my kids to be independent, right? But when it's too independent, what can happen is we can be suffering alone. Instead of coming to your spiritual fathers and mothers that are the people in the church, like pastors and pastors' wives and, and maybe a life group leader or whatever leader, spiritual leader. What God is saying here to you, don't be a spiritual orphan. You don't need to. You don't have to. There's so many resources for you. Like sometimes people come to me and they go like, you know, they share a struggle and I just go like, hey, how long have uh, you been going through this? And they go like for the past five years? And they've been sitting here the whole time? I'm like, man, I, I could have been there for you like five years ago. So don't be a spiritual orphan. It's, I, I have it. Pastor Bill and Pastor Bruce. I have like, um, when I have like, I don't know what to do, like tough situations, and, and come, I talked to Pastor Bill. He's been pastoring for more than 30 years. Pastor Bill, well, how, how do I do this now? And so don't be a spiritual orphan. See the leaders in your church. And this is a principle that you can apply for the rest of your life. It's not just here. It's, it's Christianity that we're talking about here. You don't need to be a spiritual orphan. I'm so proud of people that come to me. Like I, I have a couple that they are coming to me that they're, they're dreaming about getting married and they're talking to me. It was really cool. It was like, talk to us. About what? They're like, about everything. Like, about everything. You know, so I, made a, I have a list and I say, hey, spiritual aspects, you know, you know, husband, wife aspects, family, family, because when you get married, you get married to the whole family. Right? Okay, then, then you finances, like when you get married, you know, you get married to his debt and her debt as well, right? And so, like, see, now they're, like, young, and they're, like, thank you, thank you, thank you. All of us could be doing that, and I do it, too. And so, the Bible's teaching, don't be a spiritual orphan, and actually make the pastor's job it's not a job it's a calling but may make the pastor's life a joy not a groaning <laughs> that can be applied uh, that can be broad okay 
that can be that can be narrow. So let's talk about pastor and you guys. Did you know that I had a person leaving Obi One, leaving Obi One because we painted this back wall black. And I had a meeting because it was it, and it was white before, and the cameras back there they were losing their focus. They're like chan 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 chan, and so the guys like, hey, I know what to do, paint it black. The camera won't be confused anymore. We did that. And I had to have a pastoral meeting about a wall. I was groaning that day. Can you come to me? Yes, you can come to me. I will listen to you. I will listen to you. But it doesn't have to be like, let me make every little thing that happens here, let me make it very hard. I promise you, we're doing our best. Now let's make it a little broader. Your boss is the same way. You can make your boss's life a joy. Not make him groan or her groan as she goes to work. We can make every leader in our life. This can be a broader principle. I want to make the life of my leader, my teacher, my boss, my this, my dad, my pastor. I want to make their life a joy. I don't want them to go to work groaning, at least not because of me. Are you guys getting any questions so far? Really, I don't know why I'm asking a question in the middle of a message, but I do. Like, any questions so far? Because it's sharing this is so weird, right? It's sharing like it's almost like, oh, I hope you're not taking like, oh, you got to respect the pastor because I'm authority here. Nothing like that. But there's that relationship of being a spiritual father, which is really weird, by the way. When you receive a calling of being a pastor, you see anybody that comes into church, you see them as kids. Weird guys. They could be like 75 years old, and you're like, there's my son and my daughter. Makes no sense. Why? Because we, it comes from God. It comes from the Holy Spirit. I want to watch over you and care for you and protect you. Thank you, Adam. All right, so uh, it's a related. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. I think they're clapping for you. They're clapping for you, Adam. Thank you. So it's a relationship of love, respect, and then it talks about all of you. Let's go back to verse 5. Now it changes. It talks to pastors and leaders. It talks to the people in the church. Now it talks to all of us. It says, all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble humble yourself therefore, therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time and hopefully this relationship uh, you know spiritual fathers and mothers spiritual sons and daughters is a relationship that is found the foundation is love respect and now humility there's humility. Be humble towards one another because God opposes the proud and he gives grace to the humble. And there, there's a hack right here. This verse right here has a life hack in it. We just apply this verse right here and, and you're going to see things happening in your life. And it's right at the end it says that he, God, may lift you up in due time. What is the hack right here? So many times we fight for a promotion. And I hope none of us do this. But sometimes even people like back, backstab each other for the next promotion. Or they lie or they exaggerate for the next promotion. God is saying, no, it works the other way. You do your part. You continue to love God, serve people, making a difference at the workplace. You humble yourself. You make yourself a servant. And what happens is in God's time, in due time, in God's time, He will lift us up. That's why He gets all the glory. It's not like, oh, yeah, I had to do some things, you know, move some parts. And, and. No, no, no. You, we just do it. We, we humble ourselves, and He's the one. That brings us up. My, my previous boss before, uh, he used to say, cream always surfaces to the top. Cream doesn't have to force itself to the top. 
Just work with integrity, work with love, work with kindness, help people, be there little by little. God's like, whoops, whoop, whoop, whoop. He will lift us up in his timing. This has happened already a couple of times in my life. Like I was a, a computer engineer, but then the director of technology position became available at a district, like big operation. And then the guy invites me to be that person. And I told him, you guys know this story if you've been at Obi-Wan. I'm like, but those engineers are so much smarter than me. No, we want you, Julian. We want you. You know how I felt? I felt Joseph in Egypt when he becomes the second of Pharaoh, accent, you know? Joseph in Egypt, like a Jewish kid, now in Egypt. Joseph in Egypt. And same thing happened here when the previous pastor, Pastor Joe, had a burnout. Had a burnout. And, and what churches do, they usually go and they go to the de denomination. And there's, thou believe me, there's thousands of pastors that are looking for a job right now. And I, the, you know, Pastor Bruce came and helped us in the process, which is my mentor, which is my spiritual father, if you will. And he's like, yeah, you guys can choose. There's thousands. And the board was like, no, we want Julian to be our pastor. Man, this made no sense to me. But it made sense to God because he chose that was my time. And he, and I, I still, like, don't agree with God. I'm like, there's so many people that are better than me, God. But he chose that way. That's the life hack. Humble yourselves before one another. And in due time, God will lift you up. And now, here is the second part of the message. And I only have eight minutes, okay? This is the part of the message that, so there's a summary. There's a summary slide for, uh, I think it's seven things that God is calling us pastors to do. Seven things, okay, so we just read that, right? Care for the flock, protect the flock, serve the people. Uh, motivation should be love. Uh, be an example, a role model, and uh, do not pursue with integrity, and do not abuse of your power. Great. Now we shift gears to you. Because the word elder also means seasoned Christian, a growing Christian. Oh, now, now it applies to, to most of us. If you're brand new in the church, it doesn't right now, but it will. It will faster than you think. So now let's read the same passage with these different lenses. Okay, let's go back to verse 1. To the seasoned Christians among you, I appeal as fellow elders and witness of Christ's suffering who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Verse second. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them. Hey, care for the people in your church. Do you consider yourself a maturing Christian, a seasoned Christian? It now now the job changed. The job is not, you know, there's, there's a cycle in the Christian life, okay? There's a cycle in the Christian life. The cycle in the Christian life, there's a slide for that too, Adam, if you want to put that up. The slide in the Christian, uh, the, the other one that has like a circle thing, there you go, the cycle. We find God. We find God and, and God changes us, right? The miracle happened. The miracle that no one could do it. Only God himself could turn people like me into sons and daughters of him. And so we find God. Then we start finding freedom. We come and our hearts are filled with, you know, there's anger, bitterness, and hurt. There's addictions. There's all of that. And there's a lifelong process, okay? Lifelong process of finding freedom. We've, we want to find freedom. And this is awesome. It's like, man, now I talk to my dad that I didn't talk for this many years. Now I forgave my sister. Now, you know, this. And there's the freedom. And many Christians stop there. And I can't wait to go to church and see what God is going to speak to me. I hope he does. 
every Sunday. But Christianity doesn't stop there. Christianity, when we realize it's bigger than ourselves, bigger than ourselves, it's bigger of how much downloads you're going to get through the message. Oh, I heard something that was so interesting today. It's bigger than that. God is saying, seasoned Christians, take care of one another. Watch over one another. Be an example, a role model to one another. Serve one another. A seasoned Christian, I don't, we human beings, we make some weird connections that I, are not really there. A good engineer is not someone that knows all the books. A good engineer is the one that knows engineering. Elon Musk, I, I follow him on Twitter and, and uh, YouTube. He was talking about job interviews. He goes like, the guy was like, how do you find the good engineers? He goes like, what was the biggest problem you solved? And how did you solve it? What he's asking is, how did you do it? He doesn't say, like, what was the best book you read about solving problems? Are you making the connection, Christians? Did you memorize the, the book of James? Or are you loving people like Christ loved? It's not about knowing. It's good to know because the word of God is God is speaking to us. But it doesn't stop there. Christianity, hear, hear me out, hear me out loud and clear. Christianity will be boring in two years if we don't do something for others. It'll be boring. You're going to go like, again, we're going to talk about Jonah and the whale. Again, again the lepers, again, the healing. Oh, this parable again, pastor. In two years, you've heard it all. And if you read the Bible, when I got saved, family, I read the whole Bible in three months. And, and true story here, I'm not lying. I called somebody that was a Christian because then I, I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I called him. I'm like, my Bible has a factory defect. And he's like, why? I'm like, it's just the same book? Like, you read the same thing? Like, over and over and over and over again? He's like, no, it's like, it's like that in all of our Bibles. But I read it. Three months. So what? Let me give you two years. Three years. You know the book. And if, if, if that's that, I can't wait to go to church and hear something that I already heard in a different way that will blow my mind, that will get boring. That will get very boring. But if you discover your purpose and you make a difference and you start working for other people and helping people, helping your family members, helping your coworkers, helping people in the church, because he's saying seasoned Christians care for one another, protect one another, serve one another. He's not saying Christians memorize the book of James. I have nothing against the book of James. I, 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 hope, I hope you don't get me wrong. It's not about all the books you read about engineering. What was the biggest problem you had and how did you solve it? Meaning actions. It, be, it, be, it becomes real. Christianity becomes real when it not only moves our heart, but it moves our arms. I have a family. I have a family that came to me in between services. Up here, it's a little hotter with all these lights. And, and anyways, I had a couple came to me in between services. And they were like, I saw them, and I'm like, hey, I'm so proud of you guys because they want to start a marriage ministry at our church. And so we're working on that. They're making the phone calls, and we went through classes already together. Why? Because they're like, oh, man, it's like a typical example. Christianity can become so boring. If it's about coming and sitting and giving and sing, clapping and giving whatever your tithe and, and your offering. And, and it's like, okay, life is normal. But when you discover your purpose 
and you start making a difference with people in your family, with coworkers, with people in your church, with people in the city, that's now exciting because there's a lot of opportunity to help people. Are you following me, family? So seasoned Christians, I put a list together, which is the same list. It's the same seven items now, but I crossed the last two. Hey, seasoned Christians, care for the flock. Seasoned Christians, protect the flock. Serve one another. Not because you must. Not because the pastor did a serving message. I, 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 I can't do that to anybody. But man, we should not have this guest mentality in the church forever. I'm going to be a guest. If you come to my house and you're a guest... You're a guest. I'll serve you. But if you uh, stay too long, you're going to start paying rent. And you're going to do your own dishes. We come to church with this guest mentality like, ah, coffee was good. The message was a five. The coffee was a three, you know. They missed a fog machine, so no for fog machine. That's a zero for fog machine. It's like, is that it? We became a, a secret shopper? It's being good. <laughs> so and then what people do, because I've seen it time and time again, too, Christianity not only gets boring, we change churches. Oh, now I need something fresh, something new that I can sit and do nothing about. But it's coming from different mouths and different perspective. It's the same book. Every pastor is doing a book report on the same book every Sunday. And then we change churches. And then it gets boring after two, two years. And then you tra change churches again. And it becomes this endless pursuit of trying to find purpose when church you find God and then you find your freedom right but then there's a moment that you when you find your purpose and you start making a difference that's when it became real now Jersey is on I'm team Jesus I am serving others and I am part of the Salvation Army and I am part of the kingdom of God and so I want to challenge you, this is uh, my conclusion, to find your purpose. And if you don't know what your purpose is, I, I, we want to help you find it. And so if you scan the QR code, we do a lot through the QR code. It's on your message notes. There's one that says find a team. Click on that. We'll help you find a team. Let's, let's find your giftings and your talents and your purpose so that you can be living that out and make a difference because that, when Christianity gets exciting. It's not like Jesus was not about only about, hey, let's have another Bible study and another Bible study and another Bible study. All right, Bible study. Let's go. Let's feed people. Let's help the woman at the well. Let's help the prostitute. Let's help Matthew. Let's help the tax collectors. Let's hug the kids. Let's bring love. It's not a Bible study to another Bible study to another Bible study. I almost broke a tooth. A Bible study. You know what I'm saying? Let's pray.